So, how you going, everyone? Welcome back to the show. I'm here today with Peter Flynn. Peter is a good friend of mine, right? He's, uh, well, he does everything. Keynote speaker, business coach, speech coach. Uh, what else we got? Physiotherapist. You can juggle. Right? <laughs> <laughs> there you uh, go. A tennis player. All a all bunch of good stuff with you. So, I'm um, going to get into your story and a bit of your journey, but uh, welcome to the show, mate. Thank right, good you to see you. Thank you very much for having me, my friend. Yeah. And I'm just trying to find out how to do that watch party. Yeah. But I just it's not working. Can't, well, I can't see anything on your page oh. just yet. Yeah, that's cool, man. You just jump this phone. I'll get it. I'll get it. Go on. But yeah. um, let's get into you anyway. So, mate, you've uh, you've had quite a journey. Yeah. Now, the first thing that comes to mind, I think about you, is playing tennis in, in <laughs> Europe, right? So, like, yeah. when do you start playing tennis? When did I start playing tennis? It's a, it's a good question, actually. I think yeah. I was about 10 or 11. So I was a reasonably late bloomer. Most yeah. people start playing tennis when they're, you know, their parents push them into it when they're about four years old and they say, I'm going to live my life through you now. Okay. Um, but <laughs> I, I was about 10 or 11 when I first played tennis. Yeah. I first sort of seriously played tennis yeah. and I was pretty terrible and I never got that great, but I got reasonably good. Yeah. Uh, good enough to the point that when I was, what, 24, I went over to Europe and played, played a year of tennis over in Germany. We were reasonably successful that year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, yeah. that's just your phone going off in the background. Yeah, that's that's one. no yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was really, really fortunate to be able to spend a year over in Germany to meet amazing people, so meet some amazing physiotherapists, which really helped me too. Sure. Um, but all, all in all, look, if, if someone said, I'm going to pay you to go to Europe for a year, you've only got to play about eight tennis matches you're keen. <laughs> it's, it's pretty hard to say no to, isn't so, it, really? Dude, so... Tell me, how did how did that call come about? Like, what were you doing here before that yeah. got you the opportunity to go play pro in in like tennis in Germany? Yeah, yeah. Look, we're not gonna not gonna say pro because it's definitely not pro, okay. not that good. Well, you're ranked like top hundred or something for Australia, weren't you? Uh, not not quite that high, but yeah. where I was at the mo- at yeah. that time was yeah. I was playing like reasonable level tennis, yeah. and I got a call from a guy in Germany. <laughs> I remember it. I get this call and it's this German accent, and he's like, "Oh, you know, we'd like to get you over here to play tennis at this club in Hanover." And I was like, "Mate, pull the other leg. Like, what? What are you talking about? Like, who, who is this? Is this sort of my mates?" Yeah. And I, I sort of hung up on them, and that was that was how that started. You hung up on them. Yeah, I hung up on them. I, oh I, I my god! It was a prank call. Yeah, I was taking the piss. All right. Do you have a thick German accent as well? Or? Yeah. <laughs> re, re, reasonably thick German yeah. accent. But I'm like, I'm not that good, right? Yeah. So I'm not sure this, this was a real call. Sure, sure. And then I talked to a few friends again and they, they were like, oh no, like this, like we've gone over and done a similar thing mm. and this is real. And so I organized another call with them and I'm like, I am so sorry. Yeah. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> uh, and that's how that actually eventuated. That's insane, man. Mm. All right. So then, uh, so then what happened after? So you got the call, got convinced, negotiated a, a deal with them of, of coming over and then... Uh, so what, what time of year did you leave uh, originally? Do you remember that? Or? Oh, I left March, I reckon. It was yeah. pretty much March that I left. And so it was bloody cold when I got there. I yeah. was not expecting that. <laughs> I just remember getting off the flight and I cannot sleep on flights. Like, yeah. I just, just can't do it. Yeah. Like Maybe if you go business or first class, you get to lie down. Yeah. Of course. But when you're in cattle class and you're no. sitting up. That's all it is. It's just shipping cattle, isn't it? Yeah, like pretty that. much. Yeah. So I got there and I'd had like no sleep for about a day and a half. Took the train to Hanover, got out, and I'm like, fuck, yeah. it's freezing. Yeah. It's bloody freezing. And I just dressed as if I was coming from Australia. <laughs> oh, no. But, you know, I, I'm that person that dresses for the climate I'm leaving, not the one I'm going to. Yeah, yeah, get yeah, out, yeah. it's freezing. Yeah. I'm like, well, what am I going to do? Yeah. And then we had to go straight to a tennis training camp when we got there. Yeah, right. Straight into it. Off it the was, plane, straight into it. Oh, I was just. That's dead. pretty high expectations, oh. there. Yeah. You would have been cactus. <laughs> Absolutely, my yeah. friend. Yeah. <laughs> Jet lag, the whole thing. So. How, how was the tennis that you played that night then? Not great. Yeah. yeah look, it's, <laughs> we played some better tennis yeah. in my life, that's for sure. So, but it was good fun. It was an amazing experience and I'm so thankful to actually be able to get over there and, and do that. So. Yeah, awesome. So then, what, you stayed there for a year, did you? Or Yeah, so up to about November that year I stayed and then I, then I came back. I actually injured my knee. I probably would have stayed longer if I hadn't injured my knee. Mm. Tore my meniscus oh, no. and... You know, although it's not a large injury, it was just frustrating and I wasn't able to play at my best and do what I wanted to do. So that was something that limited me and I chose to come back a little bit earlier. Yeah, sure. Then you first planned. That's right. it. So then, um, so then what happened? So you come back and what do you sort of get into once you come back from playing tennis in Europe? Because it's a different transition again to start 
than doing yeah. something else, right? Well, yeah. just before I finished, sorry, just before I went to play tennis, that was when I finished my physio degree. So I hadn't actually worked as a physio yet. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, so okay. when I came back, I was like, all right, it's time to get a job now. We've got this. Mm. And it took me about four or five months to find a job. And I interviewed every, I had so many interviews and I was like, fire out. People just think I'm terrible. Yeah. Like, like, what is this? I had three people tell me that I had too much ambition and they didn't think I'd stay very long. Yeah, which right. probably turns out it would have been right with, with how things have turned out now. Sure. But it took me about, yeah, four to five months to find that first job. The, the first job I had, I worked at for six weeks and then I started my business after that. Okay. So I only actually worked as a physio for six weeks before I started my business. And the reason I the reason I only worked for six weeks there, uh, and I won't talk bad about anyone, is we just had a disagreement. The, yeah, sure. the the employer and I there, we just saw healthcare differently. The way they perceived it to be was not how I perceived it to be. Sure. And because of that, I decided I'm either quitting physio, sure, and doing something else like an accounting or become yeah. a mountain climber, or <laughs> but probably not because I'm scared of heights. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or to start my own business, and that's the the route I went down. Okay, so then. So then from that you started, was it Physio Fit originally or had that all come about? It was originally called Holden Hill Physio because sure. I'm not the most creative person and it was in Holden Hill, it was Physio and so I just put the two and two together and said, yeah, Holden Hill Physio. Yeah. <laughs> Can't go wrong with yeah, that. That's all right. I never thought ahead like, well, what if you move suburbs or open a second business? <laughs> yeah, you can so, franchise the Holden yeah, Hill Yeah, didn't, didn't do that suburb. quite well in yeah, the first right. place. Yeah, okay, so you changed <laughs> it to Physio Fit then, is yeah. it? Or? Yeah, so... Uh, yeah. We started, or I started 1st of July 2015, so coming up just over four and a half years ago now. Mm-hmm. My business partner, Andrew, who was someone I lent on a lot of the time to, to learn a little bit about what he was doing, he started a few months before me. He's a little bit older than me. Awesome. And I just remember, yeah, asking him a lot of questions, and he was really, really knowledgeable, really open to give me as much advice and help as, you know, just very giving, essentially. Sure. He'd started a similar thing just one day a week while he was working somewhere else. Uh, he had one day a week at a CrossFit gym, and so I'd gone and done a CrossFit gym, but I just jumped in sort of full time to start with. Yeah. And it was November 21st, 2015, so about five months into it. Andrew and I, we'd been doing lots of things together. We'd been doing work at uh, different like competitions, CrossFit competitions together. We'd go and present seminars together. So two different businesses presenting the same seminar collaboratively. Awesome. And we'd run the same marketing special. So we, we did everything together. And I remember sitting down over a palmy and we were at the Cooper's Owl House on Pulteney Street. Cheeky nice. little plug there. Big palmy. Oh, yep. mate, yeah. did love it. <laughs> did love a big palmy. Yeah. And I remember Andrew saying, you know, we're doing all this work together. You know, we're very aligned in what we're doing essentially. Like, would we have a big impact if we just joined forces officially? Sure. And we thought, yeah, why not? Like, let's just do it. Why don't we just jump into it? Yeah. And as a business coach now, I'd say never, ever, ever do this. It's a terrible way to go about it. But we wrote our own contract on a Word document that night. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the that was pretty much the only agreement between us until we officially changed from a partnership to a company a little bit later. But yeah. that was that. Had to do the deal. That was how it happened. Mate. We did it ourselves. Awesome. All right. And so that was a few years ago now. So now you've got a, a couple of locations of physio mm. fit, right? And it's... You've got extensions of uh, you've got extensions of the business and stuff too, and you've mm. kind of grown it into, you know, a business within a business sort of thing. Meant, like from what I can understand, yeah. is that uh, is that sort of how it's all gone down? Or? Yeah, look, it's it's probably hard to understand how it looks yeah. from, from the outside because there's all the different nuances in sure. it. But we do have two locations. We've got one in Modbury, and nice. we've got one on Grange Road. In it's actually in Flinders Park. Sure. But we every time we had it as Flinders Park on marketing material and on the website, people just thought it was Flinders, which is so much further away. What? <laughs> so, really? So people just heard Flinders and went, oh, it's, it's way down south. Okay. So Finden is right, right across the road. Yeah, yeah. So we just call it Finden. Okay. So, <laughs> so right, right, that so, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why we made that little change. It made a difference, really. It's right there right on the border. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's made all the difference to people understanding where it is, though. Yeah, of course. Because unless you actually live sort of really close to that, you you might look at it and go, oh, that's way too, that's way down south. Yeah, it does make sense. Yeah. So so we do have two locations. We got one in Modbury, one in Finden. Sure. And within that, we've got Massage Fit, which is also part of the Physio Fit brand. Yeah. And then we've got Pod Fit, which is podiatry, and that's Andrew's uh, wife Melissa. Sure. She is absolutely nailing that. Yeah. And she's actually. Another cheeky plug up for the Telstra Women's Business Award in South Australia this year. So. Yeah, very good. Yeah, she's a good operator. Just, she, uh, she actually showed me through the Finland office 
uh, earlier. So oh, I got to see, you were there today. Yeah, I got, to, I got to see uh, the fitting office in, in sort of full swing. It was a really nice uh, layout as well. Got a bit of a gym there as well at the back. Mm. Um, nice greenery on the walls we too. We put that up good, ourselves. Good decor. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? The, uh, that took a while though. Did it? It looked like yeah. it took a while. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Right, so, um, which is good. So I guess like what, I guess with all the gym equipment there too, there's a different way of um, sort of assessing people and yeah. seeing where the injuries come from and how you can help mm. them and like see if they are going to the gym, if their movements are right, that sort yeah. of thing too. Is that sort of what that's all about there for rehab and yeah. Absolutely it is yeah. because, and, and this is way too common, is there's so many sports, you know, sports physiotherapy places, Sure. but you've got a two kilo or three kilo dumbbell and maybe a couple of little bands, right? Yeah. But it's just, it's not possible to, assess someone properly if you can't see them move under load and you like i used to get powerlifters come in and they'd start getting pain when they're squatting 240 kilos yeah right now there's no point me looking at them squatting pain you know without any weight and them going oh i'm pain free here and me going let's make some tweaks because they're not actually breaking down under load until they hit that 240 sure so we we were like all right well we need all these things because we want to deal with elite level athletes so we've got olympic lifting platforms plates bars you know everything we've got We've got uh, powerlifting racks. Yeah, we've got a mono lift as well for powerlifters out there. There's the the gravity treadmill thing there too. Also, yes, yes. Right? So we do have an anti gravity yeah. treadmill, which is a bloody awesome thing in itself. And I hate running at the best of times, especially with my knees these days. Sure. And to be able to jump <laughs> on the anti gravity treadmill, run at fifty percent body weight, and feel like I'm flying. Oh. So that's what it does. So it reduces about fifty percent your your body weight. You can machines. take your body weight down to twenty percent of your body weight, and you can do it in one percent increments. Dude. So what that, what that means essentially is let's say you're coming back from an injury yeah. and we've had a lot of AFL players that have been referred into us because there's, well, there's only one of these at the moment and we're the, we're the people that have it. Ripper. So we've had a few AFL players cl- come in. So let's say they've had a surgery on their ankle or their leg yeah. and it's 10 days post-surgery yeah. and normally they can't do anything yet. No way. Right? So we get them on the treadmill and at 20% they can start running and they can start doing these things. So they can keep their fitness. So if you've got someone who's got a three-month recovery from their injury, and then normally there's a two-month, you know, get your fitness back, it's a five-month injury. Sure. But if they can get in and start running and keep their fitness the whole way through, sure. it's suddenly only a three-month injury. So that's really, that's a real big difference maker, man. Like, especially yeah. for pro athletes. Like, <laughs> yeah. every every month sort of counts. You want, if, if it's mm. the middle of the season and finals are coming up and, you know, you've just gone injured and you know, want to try and go back just in time for finals, right? That's a... It's a big, big thing. Yeah. Did you get a message? Did you? Or? Oh no, no. Yeah. I was just just saw myself on there. I was like, oh, this oh yeah. is really weird. Yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes we live stream. People ask questions through the stream too, so you oh. ask some questions pop up. But um, yeah. So so that's that's a really big place. So is is it when you sort of have an injury and you're coming back, say from the surgery? Mm. It's usually the amount of load that sort of lengthens the process. So if you find a way to sort of reduce the amount of load but still get the knee sort of moving. That's what's essentially speeding up that whole process. Is that sort of what you're saying? Similarly, yeah, yeah. Like very similar to that. And the easiest way to think about it maybe is to think of hydrotherapy. Sure. We put people in a hydrotherapy pool so that we can unweight them, get movement back and get them back sooner to what they want to be doing. Yeah. The advantage of something like that kind of treadmill that can very specifically lower your body weight yep. is when I put you in a pool, I can't grade it. It's very hard to grade how much weight's going through there and it's very hard to improve it over time. Right. And as with anything, slow, gradual imp- improvements over time, yeah. that's what the body responds to. So nice. if I were to start you at 70% body weight and each day I raise that by 1% body weight, you're getting a slow increase and your body's adapting to that. And that's the advantage. Man. When you explain it like that, it makes perfect sense, right? But uh, <laughs> it's, I guess it's good being the one um, company that has that machine so far in South Australia, right? Because yeah. then you can offer a service not many others can, right? Especially to the sorry to the pro athletes, you know. So, which is this everything is their fitness for their career, you know. Yeah. So, and there's big money in in mm. uh, in sport too, which is great. But so you've also done very well in in regards to uh, awards as well for the for the company. I see. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Look, we have. I. Yeah. Awards are weird. I reckon it's. Yeah, I know. You know, you, you put all this work into the award, but at the end of the day, an, an award is just a, a recognition of the people that are doing the work within the team. Sure. And so things like the Telstra Business Awards, and because I'm not actually a, a therapist within the team, yeah. uh, my role is much more of a support role for the team. The same with Andrew uh, and very much the same with Melissa as well. Sure. So it, 
I also find it weird and a bit awkward when, let's say, we go and we get the award because the yeah. award goes to the people that are that are you know the, the people that own the business and those yeah. types of things. The whole team, this whole team. Yeah. But it'd be so much cooler if you could get your team members to go up there and they accept the award because I feel like they're the ones that have really earned that. If yeah. that makes sense, yeah, of course. Uh, but we are really proud to have won the Telstra Business Awards in South Australia last year. Yeah, and um, I know won the was it the forty under forty in daily um entrepreneurs award which was cool as well that's unbelievable right that's like 40 under 40 right so i guess that, that uh, it'd be a different process to going for the awards for sort of uh, just the company itself for the telship business awards yeah. right so was it uh, a full different process going for those awards as opposed to the telship business awards or yeah yeah absolutely yeah. the telstra business awards was very it was a much more in-depth process sure you know you had this an initial application and then you had to do this massive long answer question thing which was like 25,000 words yeah. it's insane <laughs> and then it's from crazy. there you had to create like a two minute video you sent through yep. and after that you then had an interview process where people came and interviewed you at your business but Andrew and I were actually over we were over in Europe because we we're presenting an iMove U course over in London so it was about 1.30 in the morning and I was actually in Switzerland at the time when we had our interview. So we did it via a Zoom conversation yeah. and I was just drinking Red Bulls and having pre-workout and I'm like, I'm not, I'm not tired. I'm not tired. We've got, we've got this. Yeah. And they'd ask you a question. You're like, yeah, that's for me. So I actually have no idea how we, how we won after that interview because I felt like we were definitely not on our A game that yeah, day. Yeah, man. But uh, it's good to be recognized for being such a great up-and-coming entrepreneur as well, man. So uh, especially being from... SA, right from Adelaide, it's uh, old Adelaide. you know what I mean. <laughs> so it's um, it's really good to have uh, young guys like you, or well, like everyone that we've sort of come into a relationship with now, that are really determined and do it for the right reasons as well, man. Because yeah. uh, I remember you saying the other day to me, it was something along the lines that um, I was like, why, why physio, right? And mm. uh, you're like, um, you want to change the healthcare experience for the better, yeah, right? Like that was just sort of the core of it, man. Which is some pretty like it's a big thing to say but if you can actually pull off ways to make the industry better it's something that's definitely needed too you know what i'm saying so mm. yeah kudos to you for that right but so that's really your Thank core you. and and why you're in it right that's that's our, our mission statement essentially that's the that's that driving force for us as a clinic as a team mm. and it's one of those things it's that goal you can never ever hit yeah like you can you can always improve it but you can never achieve it and that's what i love is that we're always going to be pushing for it yeah so for us it was and and this really came from we don't just want to you know we want to be the best but we don't just want to be the best at any one moment Mm. is and it's you know i'll use tennis as as an example sure you look at the top four that well now murray's got i don't know where he went yeah yeah. you look at the top three in tennis and they're constantly when one gets better they all have to get better because of that right Mm -hmm. and everyone's having to level up because of your federer your nadal your Djokovic, right now i'm not saying physio fit is anything like a federer although i'd love it to be but essentially if we can help people to have to level up their game Mm. because let's say at our clinic one of the things we're huge on is client experience so from start to finish it's got to be an amazing experience sure it's not just what happens within the session sure and that's really really exciting because that means when you come into our clinic the first thing you get offered is a beautiful barista made coffee or one of our 17 different flavored herbal teas yeah you can then go you can then go and sit in our massage chairs complimentary yeah with free wi-fi so we've got all these amazing things Mm. to make that experience great sure because you know let's look at change that you you go to a doctor's surgery maybe and you walk in there and it's they run late etc it's a dingy little place it's not lovely you, you're not excited to be there you don't sure. feel great sure compare that to you actually want your practitioner to run late sure because you want a longer massage in the massage chair and you're just in a great mood yeah that actually de- decreases people's pain that makes our job easier as a therapist because people are in a good mood of course. people are in a good mood we get better results you know one of the biggest things i know it's about mm. your company that's sort of a little bit different is that you actually book longer appointments with your clients you know yeah. like a lot of times you see that they might make a 20 minute appointment yeah right and I, I feel like a lot of the time when nice to be playing sport and get injured and go to see the physio it was like it wasn't enough treatment in that time you know mm. you feel sometimes like all right you're in there you might be there 40 45 minutes but at the same time like to really fix up the injury it takes a lot of time and a lot of treatment on that mm. on that part of your body right yeah. so i mean you do you normally run longer sessions yeah or 
<laughs> It'd be so awkward if yeah. we didn't right now. Right now, oh my God, but, but I'm pretty sure that's what I remember. Yeah. Yes, yes, we do. So we do yeah. 60 minutes for an initial appointment and 30 minutes for a follow-up. Yeah. And that really just came from, we want to provide the best quality service. Mm. And I remember when we first started doing this and people said, 60 minute initials, 30 minute follow-ups, that's going to be hard, Peter, because you're not going to make much money in business. Yeah. You've got to fit more people in. Yeah. Our answer to that was if we genuinely get people better yeah. and we get amazing results, sure. that will be our business model. Yeah. We don't need to fit more people in less time and get maybe possibly less results. Yeah, if man. we just get fantastic results, people love it, yeah. business will grow. That's, that's the thing. And you, you have people that have injuries for so long mm-hmm. and they come to you and it gets fixed straight away. That's the best word of mouth you can possibly have, right? That's it, honestly. Yeah. And most of our business, you know, 65% of our referrals come from word of mouth. And I like to think that's because we do a good job. Sure. Well, of course, that's what word of mouth is, right? <laughs> if we don't do a good job, no one's going to say, hey, you got to use Pete. You know, he screwed me over and he was really bad. Like, no one's going to say that. So good job, man. Like, keep up that. So, And you also, because you wear many hats to a point, got mm. into sort of keynote speaking as well. Right? Is that- yeah, is that what? <laughs> yes, I've got in, I've got into more and more speaking now, and hoping to to really take that into doing lots of of keynotes and traveling a lot more with that. That would be a really, really I guess fulfilling and rewarding thing. And, and the way I look at it is, let's say I'm working with you know sixty people per week as a physiotherapist and one on one, I can I can change sixty people's lives per week. I can yeah. make a difference. Yeah. If I'm able to talk about what i'm really passionate about and how i think things could be better and really help maybe a room of a hundred people and maybe those hundred people have 10 people that work for them that's a thousand people i'm able to make a difference in right yeah. and let's say those thousand people see 60 people a week yeah that's sixty thousand people each week that i'm able to help essentially as as an extension of what i'm doing sure so that's why i'm really passionate about doing the keynote type stuff yeah. and i initially got into that after doing doing a course with vin jang who's a keynote speaker yeah bloody awesome and he's coming back to adelaide to do his course soon i think in about june july guys so if you want to i guess become an amazing speaker this is the place i would start and from that i just started to get more and more i guess through the health businesses more gigs talking to teams talking at events sure and hopefully start to branch outside of health now at the end of last year because of all the events i've done i was able to register as a professional speaker sure. and to do that essentially you just need to earn a certain amount of money from speaking to make sure that not just anyone can register as a professional speaker, speaker after okay. having talked once or something like that sure so through that now there's a lot more opportunities for other speaking okay so that's really good to know so how did you get started into the public speaking so i've obviously got a passion for it which i can tell but like yeah so you've got this passion like think to yourself all right i want to get into public speaking <laughs> so what was sort of the next step for you to sort of get amongst yeah. the trenches i guess in the public speaking world yeah it's a good question for me the initial reason that i got into speaking was that i was shit at speaking yeah right <laughs> and, and i i remember we did a we did a facebook live is nearly two nearly two years ago now and it went something like this. I'm like, hey, um, my name's uh, Peter and, uh, and uh, looking all around. I was like, oh. <laughs> and I, I watched it back afterwards. And I remember I turned to my friend. I'm like, oh, I don't say I'm um, that much in real life, do I? Yeah. And he's like, yeah, you do. And I was like, yeah. oh, wow, that's proper awkward. Yeah. So you, you don't notice these things that you do. You don't notice how you speak because people don't tell you, hey, you're actually a really awkward speaker or you're not very good at this. You say, I'm all the time. Yeah. Because how you speak is your personality. Sure. And so people find it really awkward to say, you're actually, you don't ever pause. Yeah, like or this, this a really, bit shit about yeah, how you Yeah, you got a really high yeah. pitched voice <laughs> and I don't like listening to you. you know? yeah. So. Yeah. It's so surreal when you catch that because mm. like, when I started doing this, my first show was with a friend of mine, but we had a really good like, yeah. sales process together. And I looked at it, I'm like, I say right, like the word right. Yes. A lot <laughs> and like a lot at the end of my sentences, you know, because I'm trying to make sure people understand. I'm like, that's mm. really painful to hear, you know. And so just by listening back, you're like, oh my God, I've got to improve on this, this and this. Yes. And slowly, slowly yes. you become a better speaker. And things like, even in my auctioneering course, I was speaking too quick when i was doing all the t's and c's you know mm. just slowing it down realizing that how you're hearing it isn't how everyone else is hearing it yeah. you know things like that too and i saw you speak yesterday for the first time i thought it was awesome man like you've got a natural ability for that 
you know. Definitely not natural because I had to work very Dude. hard for it. <laughs> but it's like, you know, you've got a natural golf swing, you pick up, you're not good at golf initially and then you get better and it's like, okay, he's got a pretty natural flow, right? So once you sort of like chip off yeah. the edges, you're actually pretty smooth and everyone was saying, man, he's so good when he, when he speaks, like you've got a presence, mm. you know? So I guess you worked really hard at that from where you started to where you are. Absolutely. And still yeah. a long way to go. and still something that I practice every single day, actually, yeah. which is, is quite interesting. But tell me a little, I'd love to hear sure. your journey in speaking now, because obviously I, I think you're incredible. And the intro you did yesterday was bloody epic, yeah. right? <laughs> it was pretty cool, man. Yeah. Still what, hearing about it today, which is good. Yeah. What have you done to improve your speaking? Listen, man, honestly, I just, I never went and taught myself how, mm. how to speak. I mean, just through school and stuff, you yeah. pick up a few things, but... It was more like I just like having conversations with people and um, just listening to their journey and what they're all about. So when I'm sort of just talking to people, just yeah, yeah it just sort of flows out like that. And then obviously I watched a few videos when I first started doing the podcast and the YouTube thing and all that. And I was like, <coughs> I've got to I've got to improve mm. on these areas, man, because <laughs> it's not looking great. So just by that, really. But um, yeah, I actually enjoy it. I was never I never had fear. Mm. around sort of speaking in front of people because I was just like, I don't care sort of what people think, you know, mm. if uh, if I stuff up, whatever, you know, yeah. everyone makes mistakes in life, so I'm not going to be too worried about it. Just keep going, you know, but it's it can be confronting. I guess mm. doing it in front of hundreds of people will be a little bit different than doing it in front of, uh, you know, tens of people, that sort of thing, yeah. It's, to begin with, yes, and yeah. I, I remember the first time I actually did a, a real public speaking sort of gig and it was at the university of south australia yeah. and i was talking to about 40 45 physiotherapy students and i will never forget this day <laughs> because i was wearing a black shirt and there is me five minutes before and i dropped in that five minutes about five kilos of sweat yeah like no joke i dropped like five kilos in sweat and i was shitting myself yeah right and then i get out there and i start talking about something that i'm confident about talking about and I realized that I've been, all this worry, all this stress, all this anxiety around it, all this fear is for nothing. Yeah, you create it. Yeah, you, yeah. you create this. It's all, it's all in your head, yeah. right? Yeah, it's true though. <laughs> and even, even when you screw up, people are so scared about screwing up. I would honestly be more scared about not screwing up when you talk. If you talk absolutely, absolutely bloody perfectly the entire time, yeah. you're a robot. Yeah. And people will not relate to you. Yeah. If you screw up and you go, wow, butchered that, didn't yeah. I? <laughs> Everyone laughs and they think it's great. And then you get on with it. Brings it. down the walls. Yeah, yeah of course. Ab- absolutely. Yeah. So that's a good tip too. Mm. Right. So where to from here? I mean, you've been doing it for a little bit now. Obviously, it's a professional part of your business, mm. right? And um, you keep growing it and growing it. So yeah. what's the plans for sort of 2020 and um, speaking for you? 2020 and speaking for me, n- now that I'm part of the PSA, which is the Professional Speakers Association, it's starting to attend their events to start networking with the people there sure. and to start getting some more mentors in that space who have created you know, very successful speaking businesses for yeah. themselves. So I'm not 100% sure exactly what that's going to entail or what that's going to look like, sure. but I do want to expand on it. I do want to pursue that passion of mine yeah. and I'd like to take it a little bit outside of healthcare with the same principles the same principles that we use in healthcare. Yeah, so that sort of coaching to mass groups of people. Right? Yeah, it, it's essentially the things that I talk on a communication. So why communication is so important and that goes across everything. Yeah. If you can create relationships with people, you'll be successful in any business. Of course. I talk about leadership and again, leadership goes across everything. Yeah. I'm passionate about marketing and again, that goes across so many things. And so I feel like I've got a lot of value to give and a lot of people that I can help through that. That's really good. So is it, I mean, because I know like public speaking and keynotes is sort of a big, like big, I guess, industry is a word, yeah. but it's not the word I'm looking for. Um, you know, it's a professional sort of game if you look at it like that, mm. you know. So it'd be something that you'd sort of have an agent for, similar to like booking acting gigs and that sort of thing. Is that the same for like when you get to a certain level of public speaking? Essentially, and that, that's the type of people that I'm talking to at the moment is, you have different maybe websites and companies that people book through and they'll take a percentage of fees and you'll put up your profile, some videos, so people can go on and go, you know, I'm looking for communication. They'll type that in and they'll see all these lists of people and they'll go, hmm, I like like what they look like. That sounds good. Let's see how they speak. Oh, I really like their message there. That's going to resonate with my brand. Or maybe, wow, that's really terrible. I'm going to the next person and leave that one. So 
So essentially, they've got like an online CV, which would probably have some of your like yeah. your keynotes recorded that people can yeah, watch. And that p- sort of yeah, thing. parts of it. Just think of it like Tinder, but for speakers. <laughs> 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 That's all right. So as long as they're, uh, yeah, swipe they're swiping right. right on your profile, yeah, it's yeah. all good. Which is, which is good. I mean, uh, it's got the whole package there for them, I guess, in that regard. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no. But it's, it's just yeah. really interesting to me mm-hmm. because there's a lot of speakers out there that I see that I don't think do the right thing as, as a speaker because it's like they're just trying to sell like an e-book or, or a product or yeah. like a course or some sort of thing too. But, that's, but there's people that actually do it the right way and do it for the right reasons, which is what I see you as, mm. you know, which is great. So I hope it like keeps growing. And uh, the fact that you've grown so much in a short period of time is really good signs ahead. So do you travel a lot for your speaking gigs or? Last year I traveled 49 times actually for speaking. Wow. Which was, yeah, works out to nearly one a week when you look at it that way, which is a lot. And that, and you know, admittedly, that is a lot of a lot of time away. And I'm I'm cutting that back a bit this year so I can be here and grow my clinics a little bit more, my other businesses. Sure. But maybe just looking at when I do travel for talking to try and fit two or three in in one trip, and also just to maybe look at slightly bigger ones as well mm. so was that just around australia or was that everywhere you were traveling it was everywhere so yeah. with with andrew we went to london and we presented an i move you course over in london sure and then i presented in scotland about communication in healthcare sure which is amazing we've been to new zealand oh, i was talking there just just a week ago now yeah. and maybe i think it was three other times last year as well which was oh, i new zealand and, and this is to steal some words from my friend mick risk is disgustingly beautiful. Yeah. It's like being in a Disney film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, honestly. Oh, 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 unreal. It's good. Well, Lord of the Rings was there, but that wasn't uh, Disney, oh. was it? But that's... Yeah, but I'm, I'm a That made me like, fan. <laughs> fall in love with uh, New Zealand, yeah. man. Because how good is Lord of the Rings, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. mate. <laughs> oh, mate. You know, but... Um, so on the on the coaching side too, um, well, what mm. I've sort of found is if I'm looking to grow myself and, mm. and my business... It's always good to sort of invest in yourself too, like um, do extra courses, like never think that you know it all about anything because you never do, yeah. right? So any opportunity that comes up for you to invest in, um, you know, coaching courses or online stuff or whatever it might be that seems of good value, that you should always do that. Is that mm. something that you would preach as a business coach to people? Or yeah, yeah, it is. And it look, is? the yeah. the reason that I'm a business coach is because we got business coaching from a very very early stage. Sure. And, <laughs> to be totally honest, I was the one that was a bit more apprehensive than Andrew to start with with his business coaching nice. because it was two thousand dollars a month. Now, t- to me right now, I'm like, oh, that's not too bad. That's not bad. It's great value for what you get. They're going to grow your business like exponentially. But at the time when we were only six months into business and we did not have much money, you know, when I started my business, I had five thousand yeah. dollars, just five thousand yeah. dollars, and I spent that all on decking out this room. Yeah, that's all I had. Yeah. And so two thousand dollars a month was a lot, a lot of, money. of money. Of course, right? But with that, our business, you know, it, it went from here all the way up to here in you know, short such a short time. period of time, and I, I just can't put a, a value on that. And you know, not only that, but to allow us to go from being the only practitioners to building an awesome team. It, it just makes sense when you think about it. If you want to be somewhere, find someone that's done what you want to do and learn from them. Be humble. Mm. Accept that you don't know everything and go. just always go in with that growth mindset that you can learn something from everyone. Dude, I think um, you've said it well, right? Because sometimes that's, you get in your own way in, mm. in your growth period, especially when it's very early on in business. It's like everything's a risk. Any Every yeah. dollar you spend is like... You know, mm. can I afford to do this? And then obviously having that much money, spending it all, and then $2,000 a month is like you've risked everything because you believe in something too. And mm. I think that's the biggest underlying thing. If you don't believe in what you're going to be doing, well, it's never going to be successful, right? So as long as you keep yeah. believing, you know, and in that first sort of six-month period where you grew pretty quickly, what were the key like takeaways that you took from that that were really the factors that help you grow your business in such a short period of time? Yeah. That is a bloody good question. <laughs> I think number one is relationships and people, right? Yeah, it's, man. it's go out, it's meet people, create amazing relationships, be the person who gives more value than anyone else. If you do that, if you give without expectation of anything in return, you give more value, you create great relationships, yeah. you'll see an amazing return on that. Like it just absolutely amazing return. 
And not only that, you'll just have this huge new bunch of friends who are awesome people. Sure. Right. And just just think, I, whenever one of my friends needs something or, or someone says, I, I need someone who does this or that, I straight away will go, oh, my friend does this. You have to, he's awesome, right? Yeah. So if you take those people who could be referrers for you and great business relationships and you turn them into actual friends. Yeah. So it's not, oh, you have an email with them every now and again. Yeah. It's actually that you're going to have a beer and a meal with them. Yeah. That person will always, always push for you. They'll always refer you when anyone says anything. Yeah. You know, let's say someone says, oh, my back's feeling a little bit sore. They're like, go see this guy. He's awesome. Yeah. Straight away. Yeah. So relationships, create amazing relationships. That's, that's a real good point because I feel like a lot of people in certain industries that, you know, obviously very protective over what they do and mm. I always say like collaborate, don't detonate. It's like mm. don't blow up I like relationships, that. like collaborate with everyone because having another friend is a lot better than having another enemy, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, we're always, it's, it's kind of like Australian mindset to sort of, reject people that are even in the same industry as mm. you and not to help and not to work with them i feel like if you change that mentality and collaborate with everyone around you and just yeah. you help each other to grow mm-hmm. um that's a key th- thing for building a business these days because e- everything is exposed the truth's always yeah. out there you know what i mean so if you don't do right with people it's going to get found out pretty quickly and you know you're not a genuine person if you're doing that by anyone anyway so if you're happy to collaborate and work together and come up mm. as a unit then you know, you're always going to have a bit more success than the latter. I feel uh, cutting everyone out is not going to be the best bet for you, all right? Mm. You know, so it's good to know. But um, now you, you've uh, so obviously you've got uh, like an exercise degree or something as well, yeah, right? So, so exercise science, a human movement degree, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And where'd you do that? I did that at UniSA as well. Did you? Was that City East or City the, East? Yeah. City, I was there. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> all right. It's not too bad. I look back now and it's mm. like, oh my God, like, oh, it's know. just such a different experience to like as you keep moving mm. forward in life. You know, it's like looking back at uh, at high school and thinking, man, you know, parents say when you're younger, it's the best years of your life. Make sure you enjoy mm. it. I mean, I hate going to school. Well, I did anyway. I was like waking up doing the same thing every day. And yeah, you know, yeah. it's it's not for everyone. You know, the whole school system. Yeah. But uh, when you look back, like the time of your mates and that sort of thing was. Some of the best times, no worries, like exactly. as much stress as you get older. It's like <laughs> I should listen to mum and dad back then too. Mm. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah. What did you study at uni, by the way? Uni, I did uh, construction management and economics, oh, right, with an associate degree in built environment. So, pretty much qualified to do project management, mm. on multi-story buildings, that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, which is what made it easier for me to sort of go into off the plan selling in real estate because I understood the process of construction and mm. the plans and wrap my hand around head around all that stuff um yeah pretty easily so yeah. that was good and then um i mean off the plans it's a very different part of real estate than mm. you know more resi sort of stuff too you know so um contracts are you know 300 pages instead of you know, 10 um yeah sunset clauses all these different things mm. that you've got to understand um which i love because it's it's not easy to do and then you also mm. obviously got to show people a property off a piece of paper yeah and sort of make it you know, help them to envision like you know what it looks like mm-hmm. as a finished product and, and that sort of thing too so that's always the fun part because you know everyone's got different imaginations so you know you've got to really take them take them through the journey mm-hmm. and we're like you guys too like really client experience focused so, so good. from the very start um yeah we actually have a look at their situation try and find mm-hmm. what's best for them and if something's not right for them we'll be like listen it's probably not the best thing to do how about looking at something like this or yeah. and even when we do decide on what they're doing you know we're with them we say holding the hand through the whole experience because really when it's off the plan it's such a different yeah. experience to normal residential uh, real estate i mean resi you can buy it, it's unconditional 30 days you can settle on it you know but when you're building throughout a mm. period of time and do construction updates and have to get finance organized and book things in for settlement and then um, inspections and all that sort of stuff just to make sure everything goes well well it's a long um, experience together but if they have a good experience you know the journey could be you know pretty enjoyable too for each client so if you have the service set up right you know then it's a good experience for everyone and everyone's happy Mm. with the result you know but the key thing for us which i feel is very different very similar to you guys uh, but just in different industries is like you know we don't sell crap 
you know what I mean? Like we won't put our name <laughs> to like a project that we yeah, think yeah. is you know, got a dodgy builder or it's in a bad location mm. that's not going to work for anyone. Like, yeah. so it's more of a macro approach to the business. Like we're not going to have that micro mindset. Like sign everything we can, sell everything we can. It's like yeah. if it, it's a project that is going to work, um, we'll be happy to put our names to it. You know, and we do a lot of due diligence on everything first, mm. but but doing it that way, that's been sort of. Another key point to our success mm. and a point of difference is that, you know, if we know it's not going to be a good product, well, we're not going to sell it to anyone because we wouldn't buy it ourselves. So I love that. Yeah. Which is in, in this industry is, is pretty rare. So if you, you know, have the right ethics in that, it can work well. Doing the right thing by people is yeah. always a good business model. Yeah. <laughs> always. <laughs> well, you, you know, you've gone through shit experiences yeah. yourself. You don't want people going through the same mm. experiences. So, you know, like how people feel sorry yeah, how people feel in certain <laughs> in certain moments and by you know putting yourself in their shoes and their perspective it's you know taking the emotion out of it for yeah. yourself and feel like oh you know how do i feel about making this call or, you know can i be bothered that's what no mm. it's like this is what you have to do this part of the process take how you feel out of it yeah and just do what's right and by doing that then you know you, you address everything there's nothing that sort of goes unturned you know, which is keeping the deal transparent, keeping it with integrity, mm. right, and having a great client experience in the process. You know, I love that. I know, man. But now we're talking too much about me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. My God. I mean, we've got a couple of minutes left because I know you're busy, man, and uh, you got to make tracks soon, which is fine. And yeah, uh, I remember announcing yesterday at uh, our meeting when I did it that yeah. you you're a man who can juggle. I was like, that's a that's a, yeah. <laughs> a skill to have, right? So. We're talking about literally juggling, like literally juggling, yeah. yeah. So when I was at uni, my first year for motor control, one of our subjects, when well, it was my second, like I actually did civil engineering for six years yeah. before I went into human movement. And the reason I did that was actually because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And civil engineering at that time at uni, say, was at Mawson Lakes, and it was ten cents per hour for parking. And I was like, what a bargain! Yeah, <laughs> Get around that. So I actually failed every subject in the first six months. Oh, dropped man. out, did labouring, and then I did human movement because one of my friends she told me the pub calls were brilliant. Oh yeah, right. So there's you, you sometimes get into things for the wrong reason initially. Yeah, and I'll get into maybe why I did physio in a second. Sure. But juggling first year, one of the things you had to do was teach yourself a skill, a motor learning skill that you'd never done before. And one of them on near the top of the list was juggling. And I was like, how awesome would it be if I could just start juggling? And I thought it wouldn't be that hard to learn. Mm. I thought one week I could learn to juggle in. Yep. It, it, took me, it took me at least a month. Yeah. And I, I don't know how many tennis rackets I broke in that time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I learned it when I was younger mm. because I was just like, back then I was bored and like someone bought me some juggling balls, mm. like three juggling balls. I'm like, okay, what do I do with this thing? And yeah. They show you like how to try and throw <laughs> it to juggle it. And it's like, ah, it took me ages of practice. And eventually the first time you get it, like, oh my God, I just did three and a quarter ball and it actually worked. It's like, such an unreal you know, feeling though when you oh get it. Because <laughs> it's not actually easy, man. Yeah. No way is it easy. Oh. Right? And then, um, yeah, that's a great experience. But then, so why why did you get into physio in the end? So that was actually due to one of my well, it was my physio at the time. So in just before I started second year in human movement, sure. I was playing indoor soccer down at Ingle Farm at Barragar. I don't don't know uh, if you know the place. Yeah, I know. Yep. And I went for a volley and I collided shins, just bang with this other guy. Damn. And I heard this massive crack, and I was like uh -oh. far out, like far out. I broke this guy's leg. Yeah. And then I stand back on my right leg. And it just folds, and I'm like, oh, oh no, it doesn't. I'm like, oh, that's definitely my leg. That's definitely me. Oh, I felt that. That was that was terrible, and oh, I, <laughs> I ended up spending the... three and a half months in a cast, so about a month and a half in a full leg cast, Jeez. and then another two months in a half leg cast. Was it a clean break, or it was, it was pretty clean? So I didn't end up having surgery. It would have been a lot easier if I'd had surgery. And yeah, that's what they say. I, I just assumed, you know, as a high level athlete, I was playing, you know, elite tennis at that time, that I'd just be able to walk back into that. I didn't think I'd have to have much rehab. Yeah, man. And when the cast came off, there was literally a bone there. There was no muscle, there's no nothing. And I had to actually learn to walk again in a pool. Jeez. So there's me in a hydrotherapy pool with these bunch of 80 year olds, <laughs> you know, who've had hip replacements and knee replacements. Yeah. And I was just depressed. I felt terrible about life at the time because 
I'd gone from being, you know, here athletically to right down here, and I'd lost my identity as as an athlete. Yeah, and I had an incredible physio at the time, mm. and his name's Wahib Jubier. If oh, he's watching. Wilds. Yeah. Wilds. So he was, uh, you know, Wilds. I know Wilds. Yeah. Yeah. So he was my he was my physio, and he helped me so much, both mentally and physically, setting goals, getting me to where I wanted to be. Yeah. Right. And that was the moment I decided that I want to do this for other people one day. I want to do for other people what he did for me. Is that right? That's right. So he sparked your love for... Uh, he certainly did. So thank you, Wabs. Wabs. Wabs was the man that gets all the credit the there. big dog. He's a top guy, man. And he's really good at what he does as he's, well. He's know? also got so, an amazing physiotherapy practice, kinetic he, rehab yeah, in does. Campbelltown. It is. Yeah, he's, uh, he's doing great things, man. Um, all right, well, dude, thank you for coming on. All right. Just quickly before yes. we go, let's uh, give everyone all your, your social medias, your business name, that sort of thing. Just give you... Self a little bit of a uh, bit of promo, bit of yeah. a promo, bit of yeah. a plug. Yeah, just a bit of a plug. We have PhysioFit Adelaide, so that's just physiofitadelaide.com.au. Sure. You can find us on Facebook with PhysioFit Adelaide. Yeah. Instagram is, is probably PhysioFit Adelaide too. I wouldn't know off the top of my head. Yeah. I'm Peter Flynn on on Facebook. There's not too much interesting stuff that goes up there, <laughs> and probably quite similar on Instagram. I, I wouldn't be sure. You'll get a lot of photos of cocktails and food. If you do follow me on that, yeah. Um, but LinkedIn, Peter Flynn. If you yeah. want to chat anything business, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you have. Or speak at your gigs or anything. I mean, I can honestly say he's a really, really good speaker. Um, really, everyone catches everyone's attention, and you know the way you spoke, the speed at what you spoke, the clarity at what you spoke was all great, man. So Thank I'm you. sure you can speak about anything. So anyone needs a speaker out there, <laughs> look at Pete. But uh, thanks for coming on, man. It's been really great having you. All right. Thank you so much, no mate. Worries, man. All right. Cheers. Thank you.